are still piecing together evidence after yesterday's shooting death in Malvern. It happened in broad daylight. The suspect who was seen fleeing is described as a brown man, perhaps in his 20s. When officers arrived, they found a man suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. Police say that this was a targeted incident and there is no threat to public safety. So my, uh, my name is Warren, Warren G. I'm from Scarborough, Malvern, uh, Emperor Nam side. I grew up as any stereotypical black kid who probably grew up in the hood, you know? Um, got myself into trouble, got myself with the wrong crowd. I grew up with a single, single mom. My grandma was also there, and I was the eldest of, of three sons, so there was like two other little brothers in the household with me. No father, so you know, you have to, you grow up, you grow up idolizing the people you see around you, you know what I'm saying? the males in your neighborhood. There was no one to stop me back then. My mom couldn't stop me. My, I, I wanted I wanted to see like how what men do, you know what I'm saying? But there was no men in my household. And all they're all on the block chilling, doing whatever, doing whatever they're doing, you know what I'm saying? With no with no father in the household, there was no one, there was no proper guidance. Guys I glorified, these guys had respect, these guys had money, these guys had the girls, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The vibe was, I don't know, it was the early 2000s, late 90s. So it was, you know, 50 Cent, DMX, Jay-Z, you know, the classic hip-hop vibe, you know what I'm saying? It was a lot more darker than these times. So growing up um, in high school around those times, I wasn't I wasn't the guy by any means. I was just a kid, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Trying to make a fucking name for myself and anything. But I wasn't a baller, I wasn't a dancer. At the time, it was like, when you go to school, you're either a fucking baller or a dancer or a gallus. I wasn't any of those, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was, I was the kind of guy that was probably gonna rob you for your lunch tickets or your bus tickets, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I couldn't get home. My mindset was, it was it was like, it was dual, you know what I'm saying? So like on road, I wasn't the same as, as I was at home. When I got home, you know, like I, I had a good household. You know, my mom, she, she loved me even though she worked a lot. I had my grandmother and my two brothers, but when you're on road and you, you don't really have the male influences and shit, right? Your mind can take yeah. you places because you're, you're, you're trying to emulate something else, you know? Yeah, yeah. Tell a man no trouble, I don't want beef, man. I just want vibes. When I first moved to Melbourne, I was uh, in grade one, probably like 89, 90. I was driving my uh, my big wheel all around Melbourne just to explore it when I was a kid. And the first time I came into, into Empernam, I rode my, my, my big wheel all the way up here and this is where all the men used to chill. They used to chill on this bench here in front of the, in front of the iconic uh, basketball court. It doesn't look, didn't look like this back in the day, but you know, so I rode up to the mandem, and that's when I asked them, you know, what are you guys doing? They asked me what I'm doing, what's my name? I told them my name's Warren. You know, it was back in 1990, them times, you know, Warren G and Dr. Dre and them were, were coming out and all that stuff. So it's like, oh, Warren, like Warren G. And, and that's that's where the name came from. It just stuck from then, you know? I wasn't anybody that, that disrespected you out, out of just, you know, malice or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? So I already had that, that natural respect, but I was, I was trying to look for like the, the bottom line respect. 
the first day I got arrested for this murder, uh, 2005, I woke up. At that time, like a lot of shit was happening in Melbourne with me. I got arrested for a, for attempted murder a few months before. So that scared my mom, Dukes. So she wanted to move. So she moved the whole family out of the Vern, but the house was in escrow for a little bit. So I, I was able to stay in the house for like a few months by myself. So I was staying there with my sister. We were looking for money because, you know, she she knew of this one place that was hiring. So we're like, all right, cool. We're gonna go there. We're gonna you know, put on our best fucking suits. And we were walking to the bus stop in Malvern around those times you know what I'm saying you have to like memorize the cars on your street kind of thing I get out and I know it's just like there's two or three cars that are not supposed to be there but I'm not really pay paying attention because I'm with my sister it's fucking morning and it's like you know it just they're not supposed to be there but so I'm walking I'm walking I'm walking and then all of a sudden helicopters fucking SUVs squad cars everything just come out nowhere bam tackle me but the first thing i'm seeing is they tackle my sister i'm like holy fuck and they're saying yeah you're arrested for murder and like i'm not even really registering that i'm just registering that they're on my sister I'm just, you know i'm telling them to get off my sister and it's not until like i'm down the street in the cop car that is hitting me what they're saying to me though you know that i got arrested for murder So this this is the this is the old spot right behind right behind Empernam. I wasn't in Empernam. I was right behind it. I used to hop out my window over there and hop one of these fences over here. And that's where Empernam is right right there, right behind these houses. So I came out here and there was a car parked right here, right where that where that blue van is. And there was, there was never a car parked there. You know what I'm saying? So I walked past it. And I was walking this way because that's where the bus stop is. I kept on moving. And there was a few more cars down there. There was two cars on the street. One one right here and one further down. And when I got to the end of that street, that's when all the sirens and all the fucking crazy shit happened, you know? I had some, had some crazy memories over here still. So it was just me, my mom, my grandma, my two little brothers. Unfortunately, I brought a lot of cops to the street. <laughs> Again, I didn't really come to my senses until I was like halfway into the station. It hit me that they're, they're arresting me for a murder. Like I was in, the, I was in complete denial and shock. They're throwing me into the fucking interrogation room. They start taking pictures of me, what I'm wearing, you know what I'm saying? They take off my shit. Then they start fucking taking pictures of my tattoo because I have a teardrop tattoo, see? The more questions they're asking me, the more I'm like, holy fuck. Like, I don't think I'm going home after this, you know? Like, I'm here thinking I'm going home today. The questions they're asking me, I'm like, okay, they have they have something. I'm not going home right now. My heart just plummets a little bit more and more because I just realize how deep the situation is. When did it actually sink in that I might be fucked? In the interrogation room. And the, the, the homicide detective is basically saying, yeah, well, you're going to be transferred to the east. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is We're going to go through the process and you're realizing that the, what the process is is a long fucking process, you know what I'm saying? So East, East Detention Center is exactly what it, this is. It's where they keep people in pretrial until uh, you get found guilty or found innocent. If you get found guilty, they transfer you somewhere else. If you're innocent, you free up. I just remember being surreal. When I got to the East on my murder charge, there's no set date when you're getting out. In that period, there's not even a set date of when your date fucking starts. You know what I'm saying? Some men can stay there for fucking five years. Some men can stay there for four. I was lucky enough to stay there for two, you know? Getting into my first day at trial, it's, it's a bigger fucking court than the Scarborough courts. You know what I'm saying? It's a downtown court, so it's, it's big. So it's like, it's so big, it makes you kind of feel like you're alone if you don't have people around, you know? The more the day progressed, it's like being in that interrogation, it was just, just the more I realized I wasn't going home that day. And then you realize when you really calculate it, it's like months, months that you're not going home. The trial that I went through, that was a six month trial, bro. Now the evidence that they have, you know, it's, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't even that strong that's strong, it was all circumstantial, but you still have to go through the motions of it. When I got up to that point where they said, you know, they, they reached a decision and I'm waiting in the box, waiting for the, the, the jury to line, you know, line in and sit down and tell the judge what they, they decided that whole time I was shaking. Every person I seen up until that point, every guy that was in with me that was facing a first degree murder, none of them got out. And here I am sitting in the murder charge. My heart's pounding, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, am I coming home? Am I not coming home? But you know, eventually the jury comes, they give the little paper to the judge. The judge reads it, looks at me, the tucks it away, you know what I'm saying? And then he asks the jury, was your decision? My heart's pounding. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I'm thinking the look that the judge gave me is like I'm getting fried. But then the fuck the jury said, yo, not guilty. It was like the most surreal experience. It's like everything just like the heaviness on my shoulders just fucking disappeared. Everything just the nightmare that I was in just just gone. Just like that. And it's just like when he said that, like it, it felt like everybody was shocked that they said that. Like everybody expected to go a different way. They said not guilty. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, yes. So I'm like, okay, yeah, you know. I'm going home. The sweetest words to my ears, you know what I'm saying? It's Mr. Abby, you're, you're free to go. The way it happened was just so fucking magical. They opened the box and 
I step out the box for the first time. Holy fuck, bro. That was a feeling, let me tell you, man. But there was nobody around. There was, my mom wasn't there. My grandma wasn't there. No brothers, no no baby moms. It was just me and my lawyer. And the fucking victim's family was there. So it was a weird experience. All these thoughts are flooding through my head. My lawyer is like, he's, he's nudging me. He's like, yo, listen, It's I know this is a, a, a win for us, but you got to hold your composure because the victim's family is right there and you can't, you know, can't be disrespectful in front of them. So it was weird because it was like all these crowns and cops and they clearly didn't like the, the fucking verdict. So it's like, I'm having this emotion, but it's like nobody else sharing this emotion with me, you feel what I'm saying? Except for my lawyer, you know? So we hugged, we did our thing. And then, you know, the, the judge wanted to talk to him and I went out the court and I just remember every step walking away from the fucking box to the door to freedom was just like, it was just so surreal. Like, like it felt like a dream. I felt like any minute I'm gonna wake up and they're gonna say, you know, I got out the courtroom and I didn't know what to do. My mom wasn't there, my grandma wasn't there. Remember, I, I I came into jail as a kid. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't have my own place. I didn't know what the fuck I did, you know, no cell phone, no, no money in my pocket. So I just stood there in front of the court like a dumbass. My lawyer says my mom's in the parking lot. So I'm walking out the courtroom. I see my mom walking. I start running towards my mom. My mom starts running towards me. There's fucking pigeons in the middle. They fly away. It was like a magical scene, bro. It was like one of the best fucking days of my life. A reporter stopped me and I was in a daze. Like I don't, I don't even remember what the reporter looked like or like I just remember a reporter stopped me and he asked me how I felt. And the only thing I could fucking say was God was good. Cause that's the only thing that was in my mouth. I'm like, you know what I'm saying? All the shit, all the darkness, all like, you know what I'm saying? Like really and truly like, God is good. You know, I jump in my mom's car, we drive down the 401 to go see my grandma. I'm chilling in the car, you know, and it's just a whole different experience. Before I was like paddy wagon cruising for like two years. You know what I'm saying? If anybody that, that you know, has been in the back of a paddy wagon, it was just a whole different experience of being in a car. So I'm in the car and I'm just looking around me because there's like windows around me. I can look at the other cars and shit. It felt like I was just experiencing the world for the first time, you know? I'm on road for two years now. I'm trying my hardest not to be like the gangster version of myself, but at the same time, I'm feeding into it because everybody's like treating me like the fucking the person I always wanted to be treated like. I don't want the Warren G moniker, but now I have the Warren G moniker. You know, I almost got my life taken away. Like I'm not trying to be fucking a gangster. All I want to do is like be this father for this for this kid. You know what I'm saying? But then the two years comes and goes. I was experiencing, you know, being on road for the first time after that whole shit. The crown was appealing the decision for the acquittal. In my first trial, they brought up a gang expert, and the gang expert was supposed to testify that my teardrop tattoo that I have was in relation to the murder. So two years now, I'm on road. The crown is appealing the acquittal. My lawyer gives me a call. My lawyer's calling me and tells me, oh, the, the Crown was successful in their appeal and you have to turn yourself in or they're gonna come get you kind of deal, you know? But I'm, I'm on road. I've been on road for two years. So I'm already like insulated in, 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 in and such, you know? So I'm getting this call, I'm at work. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not on the block or, you know, on road or anything. Like I'm at work. Again, just it just it just clicked quick. Like I, I didn't even like, I just said, fuck this job. And I just walked out. I ended up going to my mom's house. I, you know, I break it down to my mom and my bros that, you know, they, they were successful in their appeal. So my mom's asking, what the fuck does that mean? And, you know, I'm telling her that we're gonna have to go through it again. We're, you know, she's like, oh, so you have to do the whole two years again. I'm trying to like tell her, no mom, we don't gotta do the two years. I already got acquitted. So it's probably gonna be smaller. I'm trying to like, you know, I'm trying to like talk her down because she's taking it the, the hardest out of everybody, you know? She eventually starts telling me like, why, why don't why don't I why don't I just run? Why don't I just you know go 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 to fucking go here go there? And I'm I'm just I'm too cocky. I'm like yo, mom, I, I just I I beat this two years ago. I can beat it again. That's what I keep saying to her, you know. And then I eventually I turned myself in. I draw for the same lawyer that I had before. Cause I'm here thinking, you know, stick with the winning formula. And then on top of it, every conversation I'm having with my lawyer is not good conversations. <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? There's no there's no magic bullet. There's no fucking the witness is saying this and we really wanted to say this. It's all, uh, oh, this is happening and yeah, we're gonna lose that. And it was just, it was a very somber experience. Yeah, man. I went, I went through my second trial. They didn't bring up anything brand new. The only thing that they were now allowed to speak about was uh, my teardrop tattoo, my first trial. They weren't allowed to speak about my teardrop tattoo. They brought a gang expert to talk about it. His whole purpose that the, you know, the Crown brought him for was to say, the teardrop tattoo is only given to people who has um, lost somebody or they killed somebody. He's like, Mr. Abbey has, hasn't lost anybody in the last five years. So that obviously means Mr. Abbey has killed somebody. And that's what they, they wanted him to say in the first trial. In the first trial, you know, they, they, uh, they built their case on, um, 
two informants and the fact that I got a teardrop tattoo. They got the informants to say why I got a teardrop tattoo, but the everyday person is not gonna listen to a bunch of thugs when it comes to like scientific shit, right? So it's like, they had to bring an expert, a gang expert. His whole thing was just to say that the reason why I have my tattoo is because I killed somebody. The judge though, he barred him from saying that because he was saying there's just too much prejudice. Who's anybody to say what a tattoo means to somebody? It's hard to have an expert tell somebody that this is why the person did something. Because once you, you give that person that power, that person can pretty much do whatever. So the judge, he nixed it right off the bat. He said, you can't do that. But in the second trial now, the reason why the Crown was successful in their bid to have another trial, they said that the first trial judge made a mistake and that the Crown was allowed to ask those kind of questions. The second trial, he was allowed to talk about it. He was allowed to talk about the teardrop and all that other shit. And because of that, that's what kind of got me a little fucked up. The major motion of the first trial that I won, now they have it in their favor in my second trial. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it was an uphill battle for, for them for my first trial, now it's an uphill battle for me. And then when deliberations came, like I didn't go into, into deliberations with confidence versus the last time, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I already started at a low place and I just, it just kept on getting lower. Going through the second deliberation now, I think it took the jury about a day and a half so a little less than the first time. I remember the first time we were all expecting that the jury was gonna take like a couple of days. So like, it wasn't really a thing, but like this time, like it just felt like so long, like it, it, the decision making, it was just like, we didn't understand why it was taking so long. A few hours later, they had their answer. They called me up. I was already expecting it. And you know, it was the same shit. The courtroom was full of cops. The courtroom was full of crowns who were just interested in the case or what have you. And of course there was the victim's family, but this time my family was there now too. But you know, that was just them realizing that they should have been there the first time type of deal, right? So now they're all there, but the decision didn't go the way it went, the way we wanted to go, you know? So when the jury made up their mind and they, they said what they said, you just, you heard, you start hearing the screams from the back. Like, no, you know, it's all, you know, shit. And it's just, the name of the game then is just to show no reaction. Cause it's like, you know, like right then you want to cry. Right then you want to fucking scream. Right then you want to jump up the fucking box and try to boogie. The only thing you could do is just not react. Cause that's the only thing you can fucking do. After that was just a blur. I couldn't tell you how long it took the paddy wagon to get there. I couldn't tell you how long I waited to get back into my cell. That whole night was just a blur, you know? I hate using the, the, the word surreal. Cause like I use it a lot. That's the only word I can really like say that gives it the framing of what it, because it felt like a dream. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like before, like I'm, I'm, I'm listening off for the words, Mr. Abbey, you're free to go, right? These are the words that I'm accustomed to. These are the words that I want, but I'm not hearing that. I'm just hearing that Mr. Abbey, you've been, you've been found guilty of first degree murder. You're going to be um, sentenced. And all I'm hearing is this 25 years to life. And that's it. It wasn't a good day. It wasn't a good feeling. I think me drowning it out was this trauma, to be honest. After I got convicted, my first two years in the East, plus my second two years in the West, obviously counted up to four years, but that doesn't really shave that much time off of a 25 year sentence. I went in with four years shaved off my sentence. So I was looking at 21 years. Being in a max institution where the guards have like live rounds and they're letting off live rounds on you. If you're fighting type of deal, seeing mans get shanked up, learning that like, this is your life now. Everybody adapts and I adapted. I learned to, to do what I got to do. I wasn't trying to look for that Warren G moniker anymore. You know what I'm saying? So it was, it was hard for me in a sense where most times people just click up with, you know, they'll go with who they're with. I did most of that time by myself. I spent in myself writing. I wrote a fucking novel. I wrote poetry. I got back on my workouts, all that. It was up to like nine, 10 years and then I remember somebody runs up to me and then they have this newspaper and they're like, yo, gee, you gotta read this newspaper, man. You're, you're, you're in this newspaper. And I'm here thinking it's like, it's an old newspaper. So I'm like, yeah, of course I'm in old newspaper. But then they're like, no, it's today's newspaper. You're in today's newspaper, bro. So I'm reading it now and it's like, it's the lawyer is trying to use the gang expert that was in my case for his case. The defense is trying to use the Crown's witness and the paper caught on to it because like, wait a minute, this is the same gang expert that was on the Abbey case. But now the Crown is trying to say to that defense lawyer, their expert is not even an expert and he's a fraud. That's what the Crown is saying. The paper's picking up on it and I'm reading the paper 
And I'm like, holy fuck. So this guy's a fraud. You know what I'm saying? Get my lawyer on the phone. My lawyer already has the paper. The, you know what I'm saying? The faxes, faxes are buzzing in the back of the phone. It sounds like there's activity. I'm like, holy shit, there's motion now. There's motion in my shit. He's like, yo, man, this is something. I'm like, so this is appealable? I'm saying to my lawyer, my lawyer's like, yeah, this is appealable. This is what we're looking for type of deal, right? From when I seen that paper, that newspaper, it took like five years after that for it to manifest into like anything. Then eventually it happens. And um, I was at work with at the time. And then a guy walked up to me he's like yo my girl tells me you gotta call your lawyer so boom now i go i call my lawyer now and my lawyer gives me the good news and it was just like it was just it was just one of those war and you're going home fucking moments i was in prison for so long i honestly thought like that was it for me like i didn't really have any motive of going home like i i, I never really felt like i was a lifer you know what I'm saying? But I never really, it just felt surreal to actually be going home. So when I got that fucking call now, when I got that answer, I just started acting like a fool. I started jumping up on range. I remember going to the fucking, to the bubble where the, where the guards stay and chill and like dancing in front of them and shit, telling all the man them, the man them are all fucking happy and cause the lifers being freed up. So like everybody's celebrating, you know what I'm saying? It was a really good day in jail for me. It was a really good day. The Crown eventually decided that they didn't want to go through a third trial, and they offered me um, a manslaughter conviction. The process of them giving me manslaughter, I was in the East. Uh, my lawyer kept on coming, you know, he's coming to visit me, he was negotiating with the Crown, what the Crown wants to do, and then eventually he comes to me and says, yo, listen, the Crown has no case. All the witnesses that they have, they either aged out, or they moved away, or they simply don't want to come to your trial again. So they have no fucking case here. So you have two options. You can either go through a trial, or the Crown's giving you a manslaughter time served deal right now. And I remember that conversation, because I'm like, like my heart's pounding, and this is the, the conversation I've been waiting for for a very fucking long time. I felt weird because I knew I had to fight the trial, but I knew I wasn't gonna fight it. Like, I know like the right thing for me to do was to go through trial and for having to say not guilty again, and then I can sue the Blightem and sue this person and not have the stigma of being a, a convicted murderer and shit, you know what I'm saying, for the rest of my life. But I said, fuck it, I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna take the deal. So I took the deal and I took the deal against some of my lawyers opinions because some of my lawyers really wanted me to fight it they really believed in the case and whatever but i just said fuck it i'm done i'm tired you know so i took it the judge asked me you know do i understand what's happening and da da da, da. and you know i got i have to say the magic words where yeah i did it it was manslaughter guilty da, 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 da. and then yeah he gave me what he gave me they brought me back to the east and i, I freed up from the east so like the feelings i'm having now like I, I don't feel no anxiety of them coming back to me or anything right you know i, I already pleaded out to the manslaughter. So I know that this charge is done. Like there's no way this is coming back to me. You know what I'm saying? There's no way I'm gonna have to go sit in court or jail for this charge. You know what I'm saying? Some of the things I did when I touched road, I became a peer mentor. First with a group called Amadeus. They're a group that goes into the jails and they teach guys. Um, they, they facilitate ways for guys to get their diplomas, either high school or higher up higher education. So I started bucking up with them. I became a peer mentor and I ended up mentoring guys who um, had, were in conflict with the law or guys who were just recently incarcerated. You know what I'm saying? So like I'm teaching them, you know, like this is how I'm moving out here. This is, you know, this is what works for me type of deal. Then I ended up going with John Howard Society doing the same thing there. Then I started doing some public speaking and, you know, relating my story with others, sharing my story with others. What I do with my life? Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm home now. You know, that whole experience is behind me. I'm, I'm trying to get in, I'm trying to, this is me now trying to get a relationship with my son, you know what I'm saying? Because he was just born, he's two, he's two now, this is my first time meeting him. So it's weird because now I have a son, but he's two, so I missed the whole baby phase. I just have a fucking toddler that's like as bad as me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm trying to like connect with him, but it's weird because I'm also trying to find my way in the world again. You know what I'm saying? So at this time now, this whole me chasing the whole Warren G moniker is done. Like, I'm like, it's like, this is, I, 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 you know, I almost got my life taken away. Like, I'm not trying to be fucking a gangster. All I want to do is like be this father for this, for this kid. You know what I'm saying? But it's hard because it's like, I just beat a murder charge. Um, if I had to say anything to the younger Warren, if I could talk to that youth, I'd probably tell him that there's so many other paths than the path that, that he's on right now. That Warren didn't, didn't, he didn't understand that there was like different avenues he can go to, to reach the same goal that he wanted to reach, you know? I always wanted to be the person I am right now, but I, I thought that you can only reach this, doing this by either like putting in work or selling beer, beer drugs or like robbing somebody. 
I never knew you can do this by owning a fucking convenience store or like, you know, I'm selling, selling pop and fucking chocolate bars and chips. You know, again, I never, I never thought that that was a way. I always thought that, you know, I had to sell drugs or I had to fucking rap or I had to get my fucking basketball game up. I would tell that Warren that there's so many other opportunities. Don't listen to the labels that they're trying to put on you because they used to put, you know, you're stupid. They used to put, you're just a fucking gangster. They used to put, you know, you're black boys don't do this. Black boys don't do that. I just hope somebody sees my story and they realize that even at their deepest, darkest moments, it doesn't mean that's, that's it. I want somebody to realize that even if they're making the most fucked up mistake, it doesn't define who they are. Because they didn't define me and I, I'm not there anymore. I'm over here kind of thing. I'm just trying to tell you that don't get caught up where you are right now. So who's Warren now? Uh, Warren is a business owner. Warren is a father. There's a guy that's seen both the fucking, the grimiest parts of life, and I like to say the most beautiful parts of life. So I've, I'm well-rounded. Warren is a guy that um, has fought his demons and fucking survived.